Another day, another humiliation for the American mainstream media, and this time it's the turn of NPR, that's National Public Radio, a partially publicly funded news outlet that has been active for over 50 years. And just on the matter of funding, as it may be important to some of what is about to follow, it used to be entirely funded by the federal government through its parent entity, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, but was forced into changes in the early 80s under the Reagan administration. Originally a nationwide syndicator of radio programs, as digital media became more and more the prevalent means by which audiences disseminate information, they created multiple platforms to meet this demand. By 2009, under 11% of its funding came from federal sources, and in 2011, they created their own advertising network, which for many in the media marks the beginning of it morphing into what it is today, namely, not so very different to every other media conglomerate in the landscape, just one that benefits $565 million of the public's money. Over the years, there have been multiple calls, typically from conservatives, to stop any federal funds going to NPR. The arguments for this are twofold. The first is fairly straightforward. As an entity, it now engages in the same commercial practices and digital advertising agreements as any of its competitors, with all of the benefits and downsides that entails. In short, they don't need the money. Secondly, and more importantly in the eyes of Republicans, they believe that the NPR has failed to adhere to the Telecommunications Act, a piece of federal legislation that provides guidelines that any media outlet that receives federal funds must adhere to. Principally, this states that the recipient of the money must follow strict adherence to objective and balance in all programs or series of programs. Like every other media outlet, they have fallen way short of strict adherence to that, the key difference being that the others aren't federally mandated to do so. Recently, Congressman Doug Lamborn reintroduced a bill he had originally presented in 2010, demanding that it lose its federal funding on the basis that it had embraced the woke culture. And that, of course, is an absurd way of framing uh, a much more important argument about outlet impartiality, the ridiculous linguistic trappings of the never-ending culture war present for us all to see. But if you can decouple yourself from the never-ending dogmatic red versus blue bullshit, you can find examples that definitely raise serious questions about NPR's required objectivity. For example, they publicly claimed they wouldn't be covering the story revolving around Hunter Biden's laptop because it was a waste of time. This assessment that a laptop containing incriminating messages strongly suggesting that the Biden family had engaged in a series of politically corrupt quid pro quos that went on to influence national policy is absolutely shocking editorial malfeasance. That was then added to further by their false insistence that the documents contained on the laptop had been discredited by US intelligence, something they would later publicly apologise for doing. The handling of the Hunter Biden story will remain one of the most disgraceful examples of mainstream media corruption of the modern era. A full court press from journalists and social media platforms to suppress a story to influence the outcome of an election. Yet there have been other lapses from NPR on a smaller scale that show like every other outlet operational in the United States, the message is more important than the truth. In an article entitled, Vehicle Attacks Rise as Extremists Target Protesters, they used a photograph to illustrate that headline. The problem it was from an incident where a black woman was fleeing assailants that were trying to access her vehicle, one of whom had pulled a gun on her. Two of those attackers were charged by police for that. And yet this was, according to NPR, a perfectly valid example of a right-wing extremist targeting innocent protesters. They would then replace that photo with one appropriately from the atrocity at Charlottesville, adding a correction that said, a previous version of this post and story included a photo of a protester being struck by a car in Louisville, Kentucky. The photo, chosen by editors, does not appear to be an example of the assaults described in the story and has been replaced. But broader questions remain about the journalistic veracity of the piece when scrutinized. In the article, there are no citations of arrests for the incidents, nor anything that verifies the claim that there were 59 such incidents in a wave. It even undermines itself, stating that two dozen incidents are unclear as to the motivation. In short, the piece doesn't meet even the most basic editorial standards and is an example of a journalist wanting to show solidarity with a cause under the guise of reporting.
Similarly, they were one of the outlets also guilty of utterly butchering the coverage around the Kyle Rittenhouse case, not being able to resist the urge to portray the accused as some sort of maniac. In an article published after Rittenhouse was found not guilty on all charges, they stated Rosenbaum, one of the victims, threw the plastic bag he was carrying at Rittenhouse, who responded by firing four shots at the man. Now, in reality, Rosenbaum was a serial child molester who had served time in prison for rape of a minor, had threatened to kill Rittenhouse earlier that evening, and witnesses on the stand during the trial had stated that Rosenbaum was reaching for Rittenhouse's rifle at the time the shooting occurred. In no way is it true to say that what triggered the incident was having a plastic bag thrown his way. But you probably have to forgive NPR, right? Because, after all, almost the entire media landscape were clear in their biases when it came to the coverage of that shooting, and NPR couldn't deviate from that. It would be heresy. So, ultimately, they are a media outlet that tell the same partisan lies as every other one. Nothing special at all in these times. But obviously, if you want to make an argument that they don't adhere to objectivity, hell, they don't even adhere to accuracy, it's not too difficult. At the time that Massgate occurred, Fox News, seemingly with little else to do, were producing content deriding the woke tendencies of NPR, picking out a selection of comically stupid articles or programming. These segments are certainly a thorough waste of time, because critiquing such content for existing is as pointless as any insistence something not exist solely because you don't like it. The incident referred to in Massgate is not that though. It's sadly another example of a tenured journalist bungling a basic story because they let their biases control their senses, lying to the public about it, and then they throw a pity party afterwards about how hard it is to be a journalist, and then all the other journalists chime in with a show of support. That's the standard now, not the exception. Something we see on a weekly basis with no end in sight. For it to end, the journalists would have to admit they have a problem. And as regular viewers of this podcast know, there is just zero chance of that happening anytime soon. Anyway, veteran reporter and NPR legal affairs correspondent Nina Totenberg published a story that there were rising tensions among the Supreme Court justices because the conservative justices, quote, refused to mask up around colleagues. This was added to with the claim that Justice Gorsuch specifically refused to mask up to protect Justice Sotomayor, the latter of who is reportedly immunocompromised. Specifically, the text of the report stated that Sotomayor did not feel safe in close proximity to people who were unmasked. Chief Justice Roberts, understanding that in some form, asked the other justices to mask up. Now, on the surface, this is the perfect story for a left-leaning publication. It shows that Republicans don't take COVID seriously, even at the highest levels of office. It shows that conservatives are unfeeling monsters who would happily see their liberal colleagues die rather than follow rules they disagree with. It checks the box for what almost every journalist in America secretly believes, and as such, should have probably generated some sort of internal alarm bells within Totenberg. As a tenured journalist, you should know if a story completely confirms everything you believe, then chances are it is off in some way. Life simply is not that clean. But she ran it anyway, citing an anonymous source as the unimpeachable evidence behind the claim. It didn't take long for the story to be challenged by everyone cited within it. A joint statement was put out by Gorsuch and Sotomayor saying, reporting that Justice Sotomayor asked Justice Gorsuch to wear a mask surprised us. It is false. While we may sometimes disagree about the law, we are warm colleagues and friends. Then Chief Justice Roberts issued a similar denial stating that he did not request Justice Gorsuch or any other justice wear a mask on the bench. So to be clear, you have three Supreme Court justices all publicly denying the incident even occurred, putting their names and reputations on that claim versus a journalist citing an anonymous source. Which way are you guys leaning? Before we even get to the matter of issuing a retraction and an apology, let's instead look at the glee the mainstream media machine took in peddling this falsehood as fast and furious as possible. This being the perfect anti-Republican story was all they needed to run with it and take it to ridiculous extremes. CNBC and MSNBC were the first, then USA Today, Insider, Intelligenza, The Daily Beast, Newsweek, even Al Jazeera. 
And it didn't take long for the usual procession of blue check cretins to start chiming in with proclamations about what the completely false story meant in a broader context. Mehdi Hassan asked, why is it that the public figures who claim to be such pious Christians and believers in morality and decency turn out to be awful, awful people? KTS Fang said Gorsuch should be the one forced to isolate himself. The worst news anchor operating today, Joy Reid, went with another one of her patented conspiracy theories for which she is never publicly called out for. In her world, the joint statement from Gorsuch and Sotomayor was a lie and Sotomayor must have been forced to make it against her will. The woman of colour is expected to serve as a shield for the selfish, arrogant man who's literally threatening her health, she said of the incident that only occurred in her broken brain. CNN's Jim Suto wasted no time in asking the big questions. What is the strength of principle in refusing colleagues' health concerns during a pandemic for Gorsuch or Rogers or Djokovic? Maybe he wants to get into more sports coverage. Also of CNN, Ed Lavendera said the fabrication captured incredible drama within the country's highest court. Politico's John Lemire and NPR's own David Gura both helped propagate the spread of the misinformation. New York Times columnist Jamel Bowie referred to Justice Gorsuch as an impossibly callous guy with poisonous levels of self-regard and lamented him being an unelected lawmaker, tying it in to bigger DNC talking points. Jamel Hill, now of The Atlantic, said the thing that never happened was indicative of the two pandemics currently occurring, the virus itself and the pandemic of selfishness. Ely Mistal of The Nation said, quite tellingly, when you know the story was false, that it was confirmation of what we already knew. Late night show writer Trayvon Free said Gorsuch was a piece of shit person. Claire McCaskill of NBC and MSNBC decided to point out she could always tell there was something wrong with that Gorsuch. CNN's Anna Navarro said it was rude and inconsiderate. And of course, it wouldn't be an episode of Enemy of the People if we didn't include Brian Tyler Cohen of his podcast No Lie sharing a lie. Science-based medicine editor resurrected the never-not-hilarious The cruelty is the point line that was so popular during the years of Trump hysteria. The ever-disturbed Lawrence Tribe, a constitutional law professor who seems to write a column a week about a completely fictional incoming coup d'etat in America, simply refused to take the L, having initially repeated the lie, then pointing out that the joint statement by Gorsuch and Sotomayor was irrelevant because the report said that Gorsuch was asked by Chief Justice Roberts before having a pivot to repeating claims that he sounds like a jerk anyway, via the way of retweeting The Atlantic's Molly Jong Fast, another idiot reporter uncritically repeating a false story. Of course, nonce enablers, the Lincoln Project couldn't resist chiming in. Colbert show writer Frank Lesser created an Inception-style tweet by saying Gorsuch was a dick over something that never happened and invoked the name of Brett Kavanaugh, who was also smeared and lied about for political purposes by media operating in the interests of the Democrat Party. King of the Potato People, Brian Stelter, provided some covering fire for the report in his Reliable Sources newsletter, insisting that Totenberg is well-sourced and that a CNN reporter had matched key parts of the story. Which parts? Well... You don't need to know that minor detail. There was also a strong uptake for saying that the statement from Gorsuch and Sotomayor prior to Chief Justice Roberts definitively denying the allegation meant the report could still be true. It's an almost entirely modern phenomenon where journalists, upon seeing another journalist reporting being picked apart and denied, start to publicly explain away the detractors. It used to be the case that if a rival reporter was getting exposed as a liar, then it was a good thing for the industry as a whole. And oftentimes, journalists would pile on and join in that scrutiny. Now, the worry is if one journalist is exposed, given that journalists at all publications and platforms coordinate together to ensure a cohesive narrative, regardless of the facts, then it erodes confidence in all of them. So when a colleague's work starts to unravel, they take to the Twitter sphere to explain why actually the reporting is valid and accurate, and it's the people who are the idiots for believing a journalist could be malevolent or even fallible. Here's Sam Stein of Politico and MSNBC doing just that. 
David Gura of NPR openly stated that other correspondents sharing the joint statement from the judges were in some way wrong and that the statement itself was false. Mona Karen of The Bullock tried to pivot and say the real story was that Gorsuch was unmasked and was aware of Sotomayor's health condition, even though the report itself was about a refusal to adhere to a non-existent request. Democrat operative and founder of Demand Justice, a group that wants to reform the Supreme Court by doing what? Yeah, expanding it to include more Democrats. What else? They said the statement was an example of lawyering and repeated CNN's loose claim that they had confirmed the story, which, of course, wasn't entirely true. Neely Mistal of The Nation simply refused to accept the story could be wrong, going so far as to say that three judges on record were less trustworthy than one reporter with an anonymous source. Now, let's get back to the small matter at hand. And that is, what did NPR do in response to everyone involved in the story denying that it occurred? Well, as I'm sure you can imagine, they went for the old double down, with Totenberg proudly proclaiming that NPR stood by her reporting. In the accompanying article they published, they too repeated the insipid denials that there was anything wrong with the report based on semantics. It said, on Wednesday, Sotomayor and Gorsuch issued a statement saying that she did not ask him to wear a mask. NPR's report did not say that she did. Then the Chief Justice issued a statement saying he did not request Justice Gorsuch or any other justice to wear a mask on the bench. The NPR report said the Chief Justice's ask of the justices had come in some form. NPR stands by its reporting. By the following day, it was increasingly becoming clear that this wasn't going to cut it, with Fox News folding this story into their Tucker Carlson segments about defunding NPR, and so they put out another statement addressing it, still refusing to issue a correction, but going so far as to say it needed a clarification, and that it did contain a misleading word choice. On Wednesday, Chief Justice John Roberts issued a statement that was emailed to credentialed Supreme Court reporters denying that he had asked any justice to wear a mask. In response, Twitter flagged Totenberg's story as potentially false, citing the Chief Justice's statement. That evening, on All Things Considered, Totenberg stood by her story. Totenberg's story merits a clarification, but not a correction. After talking to Totenberg and reading all the justices' statements, I believe her reporting was solid, but her word choice was misleading. In describing the justices' mask habits, Totenberg's story said that prior to the holiday break, only Sotomayor was wearing a mask. When the court resumed this year, all the justices were masked except Gorsuch, and Sotomayor was conspicuously not in her chair. Here's the key assertion in the story from Tuesday's morning edition. The situation had changed, and according to court sources, Sotomayor did not feel safe in close proximity to people who were unmasked. Chief Justice Roberts, understanding that in some form or other, asked the other justices to mask up. Later, on all things considered, she changed the word asked to suggested, saying, so Chief Justice John Roberts, understanding that in some form or other, suggested that the other justices mask up. Exactly how did Roberts in some form ask or suggest that his colleagues cover up? Totenberg told me she hedged on this. If I knew exactly how he communicated this, I would say it. Instead, I said in some form. That phrasing is at the core of the dispute. Totenberg said she has multiple solid sources familiar with the inner workings of the court who told her that Roberts conveyed something to his fellow justices about Sotomayor's concerns in the face of the Omicron wave. Totenberg said her NPR editors were aware of who those sources are and stood by the reporting. Totenberg and her editors should have chosen a word other than asked, and she could have been clear about how she knew there was subtle pressure to wear masks, the nature or even exact number of her anonymous sources, and what she didn't know, exactly how Roberts was communicating. Totenberg and other Supreme Court watchers know that executive messages are conveyed with subtlety and diplomacy, not by clear edict. Adding that small detail, along with more information about her sourcing and a more accurate verb, would have provided a fuller picture as she acknowledged the Justice's statements on Wednesday. The veteran reporter further explained her wording choice at the end of her segment on ATC. Now, the way the NPR story was originally worded, news consumers must choose between believing the Chief Justice 
or believing Totenberg. A clarification improving on the verb choice that describes the inner workings of the court would solve that dilemma. In summary, it just represents an utter refusal to accept any responsibility for a story that seems to be about as widely discredited as a story can be. What the reader is being asked to do is believe that three judges from both political parties have engaged in a conspiracy to make this story go away going so far as to publicly lie on the record about it and risk reprisal should those lies ever be exposed. It is a certainty that if Chief Justice Roberts is found to have lied, it will be disqualifying for a judge and it will be blanket coverage and pressure until he was forced into resignation. And that's especially true because he's a Republican nominee. On the other hand, you can believe that a journalist might have got a story wrong and this is more indicative. The narrative itself around the story seemed to shift. Initially, it was being proposed it was a single source that had a direct knowledge of the situation. Then it became multiple sources that were informed on the situation through their general knowledge of the court. The fact that you had to stealth edit the story partway through and change crucial wording really doesn't give me confidence in the veracity of the reporting. But it's entirely up to you what you want to believe, guys. The reaction from Totenberg, by the way, is as you would expect from any journalist, it's just been one of towering hubris. In an article by the Daily Beast, all too keen to platform her denials in the name of journalistic solidarity, she was quoted as saying of the editor's clarification that she can write any goddamn thing she wants, whether or not I think it's true, Totenberg told the Daily Beast. She's not clarifying anything, exclamation point. Totenberg laughed and added, I haven't even looked at it, and I don't care to look at it, because I report to the news division. She does not report to the news division. The media solidarity offensive was also about, as you would expect, the Washington Post repeated NPR's claim that the story was only inaccurate due to that one word. And then came the pieces that wanted to pivot away from the original reporting. You see, so what? if the story was inaccurate. That's not the point. The point is, why does Gorsuch refuse to wear a mask? I mean, sure, all the judges are vaccinated and boosted and have been practicing social distancing in the court, sometimes even using Zoom. But we all know that one person at work, don't we? The one who just won't follow the rules. And that's so infuriating. So let's talk about that instead. Rolling Stone went with Neil Gorsuch stands up for his right to endanger Sonia Sotomayor's health adding that NPR issued a clarification but not a correction to its story after the Supreme Court pushed back on reporting that Gorsuch refused to wear a mask. Then we had an over at NBC News, the Supreme Court COVID mask controversy is missing the point. Why isn't Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch making a small sacrifice for the health of his immunocompromised colleague? They wrote, consideration for colleagues should be gracious, voluntary and unbidden. The Code of Conduct for United States Judges says as much, calling upon judges to be respectful and courteous towards everyone with whom the judge deals in an official capacity, including fellow judges. What could be more discourteous than knowingly causing a co-worker so much discomfort that she has to leave the room? Although the High Court has not officially adopted the Code, the justices have said they adhere to it. Which, of course, simply circumnavigates the fact that the real story should be about whether or not false reporting took place. Slate declared itself embarrassed for the Supreme Court. Why? Well, they said, imagine if everyone had simply put on a mask for a few weeks, not because the science was perfect, but out of respect for a colleague they loudly claimed to adore. Imagine if we weren't fighting about who had to ask their colleagues to do what would be plainly a respectful thing. But Gorsuch, who writes so dismissively of the risks around COVID, didn't want to play politics by conceding that COVID is actually quite dangerous, especially to the elderly and those with underlying conditions. The attitude towards the reporting failure being exposed is nowhere better exemplified than by Justin Barragona. For those of you who don't know, he is the media reporter at the Daily Beast, and that job seemingly just entails watching Fox News all day and tweeting about it and occasionally publicly expressing support for non-Fox journalists whenever they're caught in a lie. He tweeted to say Fox News is elated that Chief Justice Roberts finally knocked down NPR's mask story would be an understatement. And Cassandra Smith said... We'll see how some of the media outlets who falsely report the fake news respond to all of that. And of course that tweet was liked by Brian Stelter. No doubt as he looks to spin it all into an endless string of Republicans pounce stories. 
as is the rigor whenever these people fuck up. It's just a perfectly honed cycle at this point. 